Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about microplastic. Now over the last few years there's been a lot of coverage in mainstream media about plastic pollution and what it's doing to our planet and to our marine life. We've also seen on Blue Ta Planet 2 that they finally have talked about the problem of plastic in the oceans. And we have this word microplastic that's been thrown around a lot but a lot of us don't fully understand what uh, microplastics actually are and what possible solutions that we could possibly have. You've probably seen lots of footage of turtles or birds being cut open and the plastic inside their stomach or whales that have beached themselves because their stomachs have become so full of plastic that they'll no longer be able to consume food. And this is incredibly and particularly troubling. So today I want to talk about microplastics because I've been researching it and I think it's a really good way just to educate ourselves and understand fully what these kind of buzzwords are that people are saying in the media and try just to get a little bit better grasp of what they're actually talking about. If you like this video and you find it informative, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other sort of research or advice please leave it in the comment section below and please feel free to have a discussion in the comment section below about anything that you want to say. So yeah, let's get straight into it. So we have only been using plastic since the 1950s, but in a relatively short period of time, we have generated an estimated 83 million hundred metric tons of plastic on the planet. And rather worryingly, it was legal to dump plastic in the ocean until the 90s. And a lot of that plastic is still there. Around 9% of that plastic has been recycled, whereas 60% has been thrown away and the last remaining 31% is still in circulation or we're still being used by us. So microplastics are split into two groups. You have the first group which are kind of microplastics by design. So in the industry they have been created to be less than five millimeters which seems to be the kind of regulation size. And there'll be things like microbeads in our face wash and our shampoo and conditioner and fibers in your mascara. The second group is microplastics that are created by larger pieces of plastic breaking down over time and becoming smaller fragments of their former cell. These items are broken down over decades from the sun and the water and being pushed around by the waves and eventually becoming so tiny that they are mostly invisible to the naked eye. Now there are two major problems that we are facing from the presence of microplastics. Firstly, the microscopic fragments act as a sponge to other toxins present in the water, like flame retardants. The fragments suction them up and they concentrate those toxins in them in their tiny pieces. The second problem is that they are themselves complex polymers, which are molecules that the body can't fully break down, which becomes more of an issue when we begin to try and fully understand how those microplastics are entering our food systems. Earlier this year, CBC News broadcasted a segment on a global study that looked into the presence of microplastics in bottled water. A new global study is laying waste to the supposed purity of most bottled waters. The investigation took samples from several different companies all over the world and showed some rather disquieting results. 93% of the samples they tested found microplastics within them. In some cases there was a tiny amount seen and in others there were thousands of pieces. From further investigation they claimed that tap water produced less fragments of microplastics than supposedly purified bottled water. As to the dangers of these fragments entering our bodies, there is still no answer, as it is still a relatively new area of science. However, what they could say, which is in itself terrifying, is that microplastics are so tiny that they could probably pass through the gastrointestinal tract and enter your bloodstream, meaning that these tiny particles could remain in your body after consumption. Well, according to Nat Geo, over 300 species of wildlife have ingested this material. So as it's eaten by the animals, it actually begins to move up the food web. So that would mean that little tiny shrimp that are eating it maybe, or tiny fish, they'll be ingested by a larger fish and therefore it will continue up the chain until the big fish that we eat will ingest those tiny little fish and basically it will enter their system and then as we eat them, we're eating all of those plastics and the toxins that are absorbed, as I mentioned earlier, into those plastic pieces. Now figures like that are pretty terrifying and it just makes us realize that microplastics really are everywhere. They're in our clothes, they're in our water bottle, they're in our food, they're in our home, they are everywhere. But that doesn't mean there aren't solutions that we as consumers can definitely move towards and also to try and help 
put pressure on governments to change policy and create real change. I came across an activist and professor called Sarah Dudas and she basically was talking about her five R's that you might recognize a few of from the zero waste principles were slightly different and I wanted to share them with you today as a kind of not all dumb and glam, uh, doom and gloom, microplastics. These are some of the solutions that you can use in your everyday life to try and combat plastic pollution. Now the first one is refuse. Refuse any single use plastics or plastics that you simply do not need in your life. And then number two is to reduce if you cannot refuse those plastics. Try if possible to look for alternative solutions that are made from natural fibers instead of synthetic ones. Or if you can't do that then use a fiber catcher in your washing machine or even put your synthetic clothes in a bag before you put it in so that they're washed within the bag and trapped in there so they don't enter our water systems and our waterways. The third one is to reuse what you cannot reduce or refuse and try and get the most life out of that item as possible. And interestingly, number four is to rethink. She contends that our society does not have a high value for secondhand items and this is a real shame and a massive problem. She says that we need to focus on services rather than replacement. So finding ways to repair the items that have become coming a bit obsolete because they are broken and instead of allowing the obsolescence to happen, instead using services to repair them rather than replace them. And number five is to redesign. So we need to be moving away from this linear idea of produce, take and dispose and we need to move to a much more circular one in nature. This means that we are thinking about the end result as well as the beginning at the beginning. So we're thinking about its disposal or how we can reuse it right at the beginning before it gets to the time when it's supposedly meant to be thrown away. We need phones or computers that are able to stay relevant and current. They need to have capabilities that as tech improves and updates happen that they can take them on instead of having to be thrown away and replaced with a new one. There are so many companies that are creating phones and computers that are planned obsolescence. They're basically creating them in a way that means that we're gonna have to replace them at some point. Whereas we need to be thinking about what happens when tech updates itself. How can we create an item, a computer, that is necessary in this day and age for business and you know just generally staying connected how can we make that impact of that computer as low as possible? And she contends that it needs to have, as I said, the capabilities of being able to be updated. And that is the kind of principle of the circular economy. Now I know that that's a lot of information and I know that microplastics really are everywhere. But as consumers we really can drive change through what we choose to buy, who we choose to talk to about what, but we also can drive change through policy. Policy is gonna be one of the most dramatic uh, changes that we could probably make and we need to put pressure on the governments, our local councils and our MPs to make that change. If you don't have a recycling curbside kind of station near you, then you need to create a demand for it and you need to make people realize that that's something that's necessary so that you don't have to hire, bear the brunt of trying to recycle items that aren't available to you quite yet. Anyway, if you like this video and you want more kind of educational videos like this, please give it a thumbs up and leave comments in the section below. I'm gonna leave all the resources I've used for this uh, in the comment section, no, sorry, in the information. And yeah, again, if I've missed anything, please let me know and I will see you next time. Give it a like, subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye.